I want to talk to you about model view controller. So model view controller, as you all know, is the architecture iOS developers love to hate, right? Uh, and I want to focus my talk today on the C part of model view controller and what usually leads to controllers getting out of hand and huge files. I, I know you, you heard of it. But there's the elephant in the room, which is SwiftUI. And Apple announced SwiftUI last year, which understandably everyone got really excited about. And I love SwiftUI. And in fact, I've been using SwiftUI on my internal projects. But as many of you probably also do, I need to support old versions of iOS, at least iOS 12. And SwiftUI still has a few rough edges to be worked out. So regardless of whether you believe SwiftUI is the future or not, you probably still need to be able to work in UIKit for the foreseeable future. And the way I like to split view controllers and some of the tips I'm going to give you can probably be adapted to work in SwiftUI as well. So I want to tell you a story. This is my friend Elliot. And they're quite young in the iOS development world. And they have been working on this app for their business for the past few months. And they're using MVC, of course. But now they're facing some problems, because their view controllers are starting to become really massive. Screens are coupled to each other, so it's really hard to make changes to user flows. Uh, and they're having trouble writing good unit tests. Elliot believes the problem is their app's architecture, so they decided to start searching for the perfect architecture. Now, Elliot loves testing, uh, but they're not really a TDD developer. They're more of an MDD developer. They search the web until they find a post on Medium that seems to address their problems. So naturally, they read some company's blog posts talking about this amazing new architecture called Pi. It's a presenter, interactor entity. And uh, it's composable, testable, functional, protocol-oriented, all the buzzwords. There's actual, actually no mention in that blog post on whether they are using the architecture in production. So they guarantee you'll solve all of, all of Elliot's problems. And naturally, Elliot decides to rewrite most of their iOS app using this shiny new architecture. They also spend most of their time while they they're wait for their code to compile writing about architecture on Twitter and discussing it on uh, Slack groups. That's their favorite thing to do. A month later, after they start the rewrites, WWDC happens. And Apple announces a bunch of new frameworks and features. But Elliot is still busy rewriting their iOS app to use the Pi architecture. So they don't have time to implement any of the new stuff. And then September comes along. You know what happens in September, right? This time, Apple announces an iPhone with two notches instead of one. <laughs> and that's going to require some changes in apps. But the framework Elliot uses to implement the Pi architecture will take a while to get adapted to work on that new world. So fast forward to the end of the year, Elliot is finally done with the rewrite. Yay, they have their new architecture. They're happy about it. But they still haven't shipped the app. It still doesn't support the latest iOS features, the latest new devices with two notches. Uh, and then Elliot finds out that the company that published the Pi architecture is not using it anymore. And they won't be maintaining the framework, of course. Now, this is a fictional story about medium-driven development, but I'm sure you know some people who work this way. Actually, by the way, the Pi architecture was generated by my iOS architecture generator. It's uh, on iosarchitecture.top. You can go there and, and make some for yourself. I love this quote, and I think many developers have forgotten about its essence. I've always been very focused on user experience as a developer. And if something is not adding to the user experience, I always ask myself if it's worth doing. And I found through my experience that I'm the most productive and can iterate more quickly when I use the MVC architecture with some sugar on top. So let's talk about this sugar. Not every view controller is created equal. 
I like to separate what Apple calls a view controller into these four categories, containers, generic controllers, view controllers, and flow controllers. I'll be giving you an example of each type of view controller in this talk, and I'm also going to provide you a Swift Playground with an implementation so you can check it out. So let's start with containers. How many view controllers do you think I have on this screen? You don't need to answer. I actually have eight. I know many developers uh, feel like they need to have one view controller per screen, but this is one of the things you can do to make your app more composable and decouple. You can use child view controllers. And it's actually not difficult. The way you do it is like this. You add a view controller as your child, and you set up some constraints. In this case, it's just filling the whole screen of its parent. And that's it. And you can even make it easier by employing uh, an extension on your iView controller, like this one. So this is a very simple but powerful technique. And iOS comes with built-in containers like UI navigation controller and UI page view controller. But we can create our own. Like, let's say I need to have a screen in my app that has a loading, a loaded, an empty, and also an error state. This is very common in apps. If I implement everything in a single view controller, it already becomes massive because I have to handle all of these different states. So instead of doing that, let's create our own container. And it's going to have an enum that represents each of the states. And the content state is when I have the content. And instead of using my own view controller to show the content, I'm going to use a child view controller that I can pass as the state. And it's going to, of course, have a state property. And when it's set, I'm going to switch which child view controller I'm currently presenting. And the full example of this is in that playground I mentioned. So containers. We also have generic view controllers. And I really do mean generic. We use generics in our model call all the time. And we can apply the same technique to view controllers. It's very good to provide custom functionality to several parts of your app. In one of the apps I work on, we have generic table views and collection views that can be populated with any type of view, so we can create lists and collections of things very easily. The first step is to create this, a container collection view cell, and it's going to have a generic uh, property that's uh, any UI view in this case. And it, what's cool about this is you can actually implement your cell, it be either a table view cell or a collection view cell, as a custom view, and which means you can use it as a regular view outside of a collection. I know many of you have faced the, the problem that you have a cell and you need to use it somewhere that's not a table view or a collection view. So by doing this, you, you can uh, fix the problem. So after we have our container cell, we need to update the view that's going to be inside the collection with its contents. You could do this in many different ways, but in my example, I'm using a simple closure, and it takes a v the view as a parameter and modifies it. So this closure will be called when the cell is, is created or recycled, and then we just modify it. So this is a, just an example, but you can leverage generics to create some very powerful view controllers that can be reused in several places inside your app through containment. Now, view controllers. This is also a type of view controller. And it's probably the one you're most familiar with, because this is the one that just has a view, and it populates it with data, configures it, usually lays it out. And this data usually comes from a model. But when I implement my view controllers, I avoid giving them too much responsibility. That's why when I say view controller in this case, I really do mean a view controller that just lays out a view and sets properties on it. It could also respond to some simple view events, like a, a tap or, or something, but it should be as dumb as possible. They should be dumb because the dumber your view, con the dumber your view controllers are, the more ready you're going to be when you need to change things about how it works. And even if you want to adopt something new like SwiftUI, if you have all of your logic in view controllers now, if you want to adopt SwiftUI and reuse some of that logic, it's going to be very difficult for you. 
So to address now what, in my opinion, is the worst problem with traditional MVC, I want to talk about the last type of view controller, and that's the flow controller. You can think of flow controllers as coordinators. They drive the flow of what's happening with their children. So they can also be a type of container. Most people use the coordinator pattern to handle things such as navigating between screens. And this approach is similar, but my coordinators actually inherit from UI view controller, and I call them flow controllers. But the name doesn't really matter. Uh, by inheriting from UI view controller, we avoid fighting UI kit. So we can take advantage of uh, like things like the responder chain and lifecycle callbacks. So let's see an example of this. Using this approach, let's say we are using a coordinator that uh, inherits from NS object, and it's going to be managing a view controller. And it's going to present a detail view that's managed by another coordinator that's also an NS object. What happens when I dismiss that second view controller? What happens is I need to do something about this detail coordinator because it's going to be around still. So by actually making, yeah, so it's still there. It's not gone. So by inheriting from UI view controller, we can have our main flow controller, and it's going to have its UI be a child of itself. And it's going to present a detailed flow controller that takes the part of the coordinator and has its own UI as a child. And the good thing is detail flow controller will also get view did load, view will appear, all of those callback methods. So we can react to that by like kicking off some network requests or something. And when we dismiss the detail flow, it's gone. We don't need to worry about it. UIKit takes care of making it go away for us. So let's say we have a screen in our app that downloads a list of geographical regions from some API. It shows the regions, and the user can select a region and see more info about it. Instead of having this one regions controller that does the loading and has a list uh, and reacts to selection and presents the detail, we'll have a regions flow controller that does the loading. It then populates the regions controller, which is his child when data arrives. Also, the flow controller will get a callback when a region is selected, and it's going to push a detail flow controller. So this controller manages the entire flow, so it will not be inside a UI navigation controller. Instead, it will own a navigation controller that's going to be one of its children, and it's going to push and pop view controllers inside of it. With this approach, we managed to create a reusable flow with view controllers that are completely decoupled from each other and can be used in different flows as needed. And we can change the flow controller if we need to change the order things happen in and the, the order that views appear in without having to worry about what happens in the children. So the list controller doesn't know where it's in or which other controller is going to show up. It just knows how to show a list. And when something is selected, it tells its parent that it was selected. So with this, we can encapsulate extremely complex user flows, such as, say, a checkout process in an e-commerce app inside the flow controller. And it can be presented and embedded in different ways to achieve the result we want. So we have a reasonable way of structuring our app and making things decoupled without fighting UIKit. So I hope you learned something about the way you can improve view controllers with these examples. And now that I've talked about view controllers, I would like to focus on another common issue that some developers face with MVC. And this is especially common for younger developers. And it happens when a developer feels like they have to fit everything into one of those three ladders, M, V, or C, forgetting that they are allowed to create other types of constructs. And one that I'm a fan of is the view model. My models. Uh, my view models are just like models, but they are tailored to a specific type of view or view controller. And they are usually created from a model. So let's say I have a post model in a blogging app, and it has a publish at property that's a date. A post view model will have a, pub a publish at property that's a string already formatted. And it will be initialized using a post model. But the post view model is 
data that's ready to be presented on screen as is. In this example, I also use personal name components for the author. That way we can localize the way the name is presented because full names are different depending on locale. So this is another example, but there are many more types of, of, types of entities that you can leverage to make your apps more modular, testable, and ultimately fun to work on. Uh, in fact, if I were to try and make a name for the architecture I use, it would probably be composed of way more than just three or four letters. And uh, I prefer to just call it MVC because of that. So the key takeaways I hope you got from my talk is that first, you'll be fine. Like, no matter the architecture you're using, don't feel like you need to adopt a completely new architecture in order to create a good product. And also that perhaps the most important one is that the products are more important than the tools used to make them. I used to work in video production, and in that industry, it's very common for people to ask you, like, which camera did you use or which lens did you use to make something? And it's like that's what made the product what it is instead of your talent and creativity. And as developers, I think it's completely normal and fine for us to be excited about our tools. It's, it's completely fine. But I think we shouldn't forget that our job is actually to provide a great experience to our users. Thank you very much.